you'll, you'll often hear us around here talk about ICE teaching. Here's what ICE stands for. I stands for Isagogies. That's a historical background. I did that in the first hour. Uh, I did a preview of, it, of the ICE concept. Uh, today, we're going to do the E part of ICE. That's exegeting. I'm going to show you some of the dynamics of the, our passage, which is the second chapter, 1 through 7. Next Sunday, I'm actually going to do a doctrine from it. Okay? But I think this gives us a, this passage... There's no way you can see all the stuff that's in it, okay? So I want to help you. I want you to walk through with this. Uh, so what we're doing is a homiletic examination of our text, uh, context, actually. We're doing a homiletical examination. Uh, we're going to do a five-point homiletical. Now, I have some people in here, and if you'd like to do a homiletics class, come on with us uh, every second, fourth Saturday. We've just gone through our first class. You can still drop in. Homiletics teaches you how to take a passage of Scripture, study it, and, and learn from it in order to instruct others, even teach. Uh, all Sunday school teachers or uh, pastors or anybody who teaches studies out of the Bible ought to learn homiletics. And so these five homiletics point, for those who are taking homiletics would understand this, but it's a concept. It's a concept of exegeting in a certain way, and that is looking for a text in context. Well, uh, so I want to show you five things in this hour that are important to this passage, which I'm going to do a doctrine from next week. In James 2.1, James 2.1, if you recall, gives the main idea of the context. Uh, I'm thankful to James that he does that. Often they don't do that. James is a guy who does do that. And so that's important. And so when you read that back in James 2.1, um, well, anyhow, that's the main idea. Let me see if I can pull up James quick on this. My brethren, do not hold your faith uh, in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism that's a really a great idea for him as he's, he's beginning to know that he has to break from the old covenant and go to new covenant because Jesus Christ, the Messiah, has come. James did not believe that until, until he was raised from the dead. And after the Christ was raised from the dead, James believed that. And so this is a, a great, uh, and the word brethren, I talked about that earlier, oh, do not hold any, any, and actually it's more, impar it's an imperative with the negative meaning stop. We must stop showing partiality and prejudice in the assembly hour uh, at, at within, within the body of Christ. Uh, it is given by a negative imperative. May is the negative of echo, present active imperative, second person plural. Now, every once in a while, I'll get students that go through first-year Greek with us, and they find something that throws them a loop. Because in the Greek language, the present indicative and the present imperative are identical in the Greek language. They look identical. So it's a judgment call when it comes down to whether you translate this. I tell you that because there are some commentators that show this as an indicative. The real clue is knowing does the writer use a lot of imperatives? What was the answer be? Oh, yeah. 54 to 108 verses is a lot of, uh, of imperatives, which are commandments. They, now, they could, it could be a not, right? Uh, like in the Ten Commandments, you have, a, you have the positive and the negatives. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, do this, you know. Uh, but is there a lot? So one of the keys is, is the writer, does the writer over the course of the book, does he use the imperative a lot? The answer is, oh, yeah. 
<laughs> he uses it a lot. That's a good clue because when you have the negative may on the front of this word, it's more likely going to be translated in, translated an imperative, especially if the writer is doing that. Okay? And the writer is certainly doing it. He's using it a lot. He, and he used it a lot in chapter 1. You probably didn't pay attention to it that much. But he did a lot in chapter 1. And, and, and again, he's come out. In seven verses, he's given five commands. <laughs> That's a lot. I mean, if you were a teenager and, you, and your parent gave you that many commands at one time, that'd be a whole lot to swallow, wouldn't it? That's a, it's, a, oh, it's a whole lot, even here. So... Uh, we translate this, most of us translate this as a negative imperative and it should be translated, you are, you are not holding on to the faith of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ when you practice partiality. See, that's what the writer is talking about. And, he, and here's what it says stronger than that is a commandment. Stop doing that. Do not do this. And then he's going to give an example of what was common practiced in the synagogue in verses 2 through 7. So I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to give, give you a heads up on that. Therefore, what he's saying to you is the exercise of faith, which we call the faith cycle, and mental attitude, sense of prejudice, of partiality, and that type, that's a mental attitude sin, agreed? Bias, prejudice, that in the body of Christ is a sin. It's a, called a mental attitude sin. These are mutual exclusive, and he's, he's, he starts off by telling you that. Do, do you understand? And he uses the word faith and, and mental attitude sin, and they're, they're exclusive. Stop doing that because it excludes this. You can't do that because the body of Christ is to be one, of one mind, one heart, one soul, one heartbeat. That's, that's, our, that's our goal. That's the way it ought to be. So he starts out with that, and I think that's very important. I did the Amplified. Are you familiar with the Amplified Bible? Well, the interesting thing about it, Amplified is that it looks at the Greek text and it runs all kinds of scenarios from the Greek words out. And so they give you a whole lot of stuff. They take a word and go like, well, I could do this or that. that. Watch what they did with this. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting you buy one more Bible. <laughs> I, mean, I know most of you got so many. Uh, maybe you could trade one in, in for this. But the Amplified, listen to what it says. See, most of us that teach, we're junkies with Bibles anyhow. So, I mean, I got just about everything you can imagine. My brethren, pay no... Listen to how they interpret this. My brethren, pray no servitude regarding to people showing no prejudice, no partiality. Do not attempt to hold and practice the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory together with snobbery. 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 <laughs> I like that. You don't hear that much, right? When I was a kid growing up, they said, hmm, you got your nose in the air, you're a snob. Remember that? I don't know what they do now, but they probably don't talk about it because it's not political correct, but we didn't pay any attention to that stuff when I was a kid, did you? I mean, they called you everything. Um, and then they would say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but right? Do your parents ever tell you that? You'd come home and say, well, <laughs> they talk bad about me. Well, sticks and stones. they go like, well, they ain't got sticks and stones. Well, you're in good shape. Wait till they get to sticks and stones, then worry. <laughs> well, anyhow, here's the second thing. In James 2.2, James 2.2, For if a man comes into your assembly, your synagogue, with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, how are we going to treat him? They, these are visitors. The concept is visitors. Okay? James 2.2, in other words... All visitors should be welcome. Doesn't matter what their race, their education, whatever, they should all be welcomed, agreed? That's the way it ought to be. But it's... And if it's not, there's bias. There's prejudice. But, you know, people think, well, look, I'm for the rich man because he may put more in the coffin. The coffer. <laughs> uh, there is a slight difference there. <laughs> uh, 
See, I'm living proof that anybody can do this. <laughs> I'm living proof that anybody can do this. James 2.2 introduces this subject with a unique third-class condition. See the word if? That's a third-class condition. In the Greek language, there are four, and they all look the same in the English. But they don't look the same in the Greek. This is a third-class condition. It means maybe. And so he's using an illustration of a common practice that was happening in the synagogue. The protestants, we call the if is the protestants, and the then is the apotesis in the Greek language of a condition clause, a conditional clause. So the protestants consist of verse 2 and 3. Now watch this, because that's a long if. If, it's a long if. Those verse 2 and 3, that's all part of the if. Verse 4 introduces the then and goes all the way to verse 7. This is an unusual third-class condition, Greek, uh, Greek uh, third-class condition. Let me say it again. Verse 2 and 3 is the if. Verse 4 through 7 is the then. This makes this really different. That's important. When you read it, if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring dressed in fine clothes, by the way, I came in with a gold ring, but I didn't get it with the fine clothes, so I get a pass. Verse 3, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, oh, sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, stand over here or sit under my feet, sit on the floor. Now, they're not as privileged as you are. You can go. If we were to say that to you, you got you got 500 choices to go somewhere to set, right? Whatever distance you drive from your house to this church, you could drive any that same distance in all the directions, you'd find 500 churches at least, right? So if you say to this guy, sit on the floor, and there's a lot of places to sit, but they've been reserved for people who can contribute something with their appearance and their whatever. They think they're rich. Who knows if a rich man's rich? He just could be further in debt. How do you know if a rich man's rich? And listen, we know God don't care. Because, you know, he applauds the widow's might. Now, it may have been only one clapping. But it was the widow might that got all the credit. It wasn't the people dropping into big bills that weren't big at all. That weren't as big as her might. Well, anyhow. Now, here's another thing that's interesting. We got the if clause and the then clause. Agreed? If is verse 2 and 3. The then part of the clause, right? The apotesis is, is verse 4, 5, 6, and 7. Agreed? Well, I, I, just saying that's the way it is. If you want to come check us out, when we, when we teach Greek the next time coming, you can learn all this in 101. But... Watch this. Verse 4, 5, 6, and 7. Are, have you got your Bibles open? 4, 5, 6, and 7. That's the then part of it. You know, if such and such, then such and such. Watch this. Now look and see if your Bible does this. You might have a good Bible. Verse 4. Is there a question mark? Verse 5. Is there a question mark? Verse 6. Is there a question mark? Verse 7. Is there a question mark? I don't know if you'd have paid any attention to that. Four questions 
in the then part of this. If that's true, then this is true. Are you with me? Now, you could have, did your Bible have a question at all four? That's good. If it didn't, it wouldn't matter because they're all there anyhow. Because in the original language, it's there. And do you know what's unusual? Now, pay attention. I don't know if you'll ever study the Greek, but listen, here we talk about it. Do you know how the Greek question looks like in the Greek text? It looks like a semicolon, and it drives you nuts. <laughs> it drives you nuts because you're used to semicolons, a semicolon, and it, the sentence goes on. Right? And so the Greek question mark is a semicolon in the Greek language, and it drives you nuts until you learn it. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't write the Greek language and don't know much about the English, so I'm just telling you the way it is. Now, here's one thing you can't see. These are rhetorical questions. You can see that. These are rhetorical questions. Listen to me now. That's introduced with an O-U-C-H rather than an O-U-K. Ook. You know what that means when you see that with a rhetorical? It means, oh, listen to me. I love this. It means every one of these questions have a yes answer. Wouldn't you like to have a teacher that said your entire grade for this semester is going to be based on four questions that are in the affirmative? And don't tell you what an affirmative is. They leave that up to you to guess. And so you come to class, and I mean everything is based on this, Gives you four questions, and they all the answer to every one of them is yes. <laughs> I love that teacher because he teaches with a great system of grading, and that's the way God teaches. Why would you want to be under the law when you can sit under grace that gives you all the answers and doesn't require anything from you but to believe? <laughs> You see, even I can work for this guy. Whether your lights are half on or half off, you can work for this guy. And that's exactly what we have. Number three, this third class condition has a series of five aorist subjunctives. You can't see that. But boy, are they important. Five, listen, a third class, listen to me, look up here. A third class condition always has a subjunctive. As soon as you see that that's a third class if, it has to have a subjunctive. That's what makes that a third class condition. It's E-A-N plus the subjunctive. You know what makes this different? <laughs> it's got five. It's got five. It's a series. Boom, 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 boom. If this was a six-shooter, he'd only have one bullet left. That if is connected to all five of them. Chicka-boom, 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 boom, boom. I almost wanted to dance there. Did you notice that? If I'd have had one more shaboom, I think I could have broke out. James illustrates by these subjunctives in 2 and 3, James illustrates a common occurrence in the Jewish synagogue among Jewish believers. A rich man comes in, a visitor. A poor man comes in, a visitor. But you have respect for the rich man because you're a respecter of persons. You say to the rich man, oh, come sit here. And you say to the poor man, down on the floor, dog. <laughs> Whoa. 
Now, the floor may be the proper place for the dog, but not for the visitor. Well, there are available seats, but they're reserved. Now, that stuff. <laughs> Did you note that all five were in the Protestants? Well, I just told you. They're in the if part. If plus a subjunctive. Boom, 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 boom. Five of them in the Protestants. That's setting up a scenario for then. You can't get that in the English. On your best day, alert under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Eyeball to eyeball with all of that stuff. You can get that. You got to know that that's a third class condition looking for subjunctives. And then you look and you see there are five of them. Boom. They're all attached in verses two and three. I'm just telling you why I make that big money. I'm telling you why I'm the guy. Because I'm telling you, I am dedicated to that kind of information. I dig this out, and I thank you. I salute you because you pay me to stay home and do something I love better than breathing air. Don't let me carry. Get, I'm not. Don't let me get carried away here. But I love this a lot, and I am so thankful every day when I sit down there. I, I just thank you so much that God has led you in your heart to support my ministry, that I can sit home and do something I love more than anything in this whole wide world to bring you this kind of information. I thank you. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Never would I believe that God would give me such gracious people as you to do something I love. I would do this whether I got paid or not. This is what I've been called to do. Just the fact that you support that is beyond me. And I thank I thank you. I thank God every day for you that you do this for me. I take none of this lightly. Well, do you wonder about the apotheosis, verses 4 through 7, with the rhetoricals? Here's point 4. Ver verses 4 through 7 contains three, the third class, ap uh, the uh, apotheosis, the apotheosis. It consists of four rhetoricals that expect the S- it's O-U-C-H. That's the clue. James is, enc is encouraging these believers to see the error of their way, but doesn't give them the doc doctrinal solution, does he? Once again, he scolds them and tells them to stop doing it and doesn't tell them how they can change their mind by the word of God and how they can behave under the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the answer to this whole problem. Would you not agree with that? Just like bridle your tongue. And listen, this is a part of their culture. James says, listen, this is prevalent in all the synagogues. This is a cultural deal. This is cultural. This has been built in culturally. You grew, they grew up with it. You understand that, don't you, in the South? There are certain things that you grew up culturally that were forbidden in the Word of God. You can't tell it to certain people they can't come to church when it's open to all people. You can't tell people where to sit. If you, if you want to sit a certain place, get here early. That used to be the church we had. You used to have to get here early to get your favorite seats. Now we just keep them open for the rich people who come. <laughs> of course I'm being... A naughty boy here. So one of the things, five, six, seven, no, no, four, five, six, and seven, right? Every one of those are rhetorical questions that expect what answer? So here's what I want you to do. See four, five, six, and seven? Just write the word yes. You all got a hundred. You ought to thank God for grace because that's the way you live with him. He gives you 100%. You, listen, anytime you work for grace, 100%. 
in your Greek text, oh, I explained that. Here's five. There are five imperatives. There are five commands. I got seven verses. I got five commands. Whew. Five commands. In, in verse one, I have a command. My brethren, partiality is not the faith, is not the exercise of faith in God, right? In the, in the Lord. In verse three, I've got sit, stand, or sit. Sit is to the rich man, stand or, or sit under my feet. <sighs> How would you like to come in? He said, well, listen. You can sit in the more, poor man's chair or you can sit on the floor next to me. But he's not sitting on the floor. He means I'm sitting on the pew. You sit down on the floor next to me. I want you to behave. I got my eye on you. <laughs> Somebody come in here with long hair? Huh? You think it's a girl? Then you take a better look? You go like, I'm not sure, and you take a better look? By halftime, you, you're really looking good to find out? Boom, it's a guy. You know what the Word of God will do? If you leave him alone, you know what the Word of God will do? It'll cut his hair. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people like this. Listen, the Word of God will change your life. And if it's not, something's wrong with you. It's not the Word of God. It's not the one who's teaching it. Something's wrong with you. You're not exercising it. You don't have to tell people go to a haircut. You don't have to tell people lose weight. You don't have to tell people dress better. You don't have to tell people any of that stuff. It's none of your business. You got to thank God that they're here. We don't have special seats. <laughs> Little church of pastor. They had a row of seats over here. I said, what is that? They said, that's the board of deacons. I said, they're going to sit up here when I stand here? They said, yeah. I said, nope. Nope, because I'll be over here all the time looking at them, preaching to them. That would make everybody nervous, especially the congregation. They want to sit in place, set them on the front row. All you deacons, the first two rows are for you. Not you deacons, but them. When I took them away, I said, we're, we're not we're not having none of this. Who, who, are, who are these people? We're not going to do that. You're going to have to choir. You're not going to sit up there either. You're going to go down there and say, I want my eyeballs on you. You can sit down here with the rest of us. See, even this bothers me. I'm elevated over the congregation. See, this bothers me. See, I just might can walk up and down that row. I just might. If it's me, but we, we got cameras and all that kind of stuff, and I understand that. Listen, I'm a game player. But if it's me, I've done this before. I'd mic up and walk them down the ground. I'd stop by your pew and talk to you. I'd stop by a pew, a guy that I know I've been praying to get him saved, and I'd have a little conversation with him right off the bat. You like me better up here, don't you? This, this is getting better every day. I'm not going to have none of that. I got no big wigs. We got no big wigs. I'm not a big wig. They're not a big wig. There's no big wigs. Verse 5, the word listen. Hey, another thing, I wrote these down. When you see a present imperative, that's different than an aorist imperative. <laughs> you won't pay attention to that. Look. I got a present imperative, I got a present imperative, I got an aorist imperative, I got a present imperative, and I got an aorist imperative. they all saying something a little bit different. Because when you have an aorist imperative, you had a hut to command. When you have a present, you have a standing command. 
You know what a hut to command is? I want that, I want your room cleaned before supper or no supper. They said, well, <laughs> and so the kid asked, what we have in <laughs> right? I've been there. I've been that kid. Then I'd feel this long arm of God stretch out for my mother and grab me. <laughs> because depending on what she was having, I might just go be a little rebellious. I might you usurp my authority a little bit myself. Didn't work with my mama. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Note the closing statement made amidst the question of verse 6. Out of all these questions, yes, 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 yes. He introduces, right? All of them have yeses. In the midst of it, in verse 6, he makes a bold statement. And you go like, whoa, whoa, where'd that come from? Listen to what he said. But you have dishonored the poor man. And it, it glares. You've got these yes, 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 and all of a sudden you've got this boom statement. Well, that's where we're going. Boy, I tell you, I've really given you a lot of stuff today. Didn't lose too many, lost a few, but that's all right. Be sure, listen, if, if you had missed last Sunday, it's important. Everybody has got to vote on that ballot back there, yes or no. It's important that we have a good, clear reading because we didn't get it the last time with 36 people voting. That's not good enough. Everybody votes. And listen, it, I don't care. Vote your conscience. Vote, vote what you believe God wants in your heart. That will be fine with me. But vote. And it's very clear. Vote to stay or vote to go. It's very clear. Vote your conscience. Vote prayer. Go into prayer, vote your conscience, and do what you think God wants what's best for you in this church. And that's fine with us. It's fine with me. I want you to vote, and I want you to vote your conscience through prayer. Okay? We, we've told you about everything we know to tell you. I don't know much else to tell you other than pray and vote. <laughs> and so we, we, gotta have a very, we have to have more clear voting, and we'll vote through. So tell everybody they need to vote. Uh, put it down, you sign it or initial it so we know that we've counted every person. Uh, that's very important to us. And we, we, but we, we have to have a more clear, precise count. And is there anything else, Mary, on that? No, I think that's pretty it. And by the end of the month, the first, the first of September, uh, we'll tell you what, how, how, what the reading was and what the decision will be. That will be very important to us in the life of our church. Um, also, let me tell you that uh, September the 9th, that's our agape feast. I know all of a sudden, I went, whoa, it's sitting right on top of us. Uh, that's the Sunday after Labor Day is our agape feast. So invite people, invite friends. It'll be a, a eating on the ground day. Not literally, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, I, we had people sitting on the ground, so I didn't want to make that distinction. And um, you bring one meat, one vegetable, one dessert, you know, banana pudding, something like that. I tell you, Mike just about choked me out on banana pudding the other day. That guy can make good banana pudding. and Don't bring it anymore for a while, Mike. A meat, a vegetable, a dessert. For your family plus one, the church will get the, will bring, uh, will do everything else. We'll do the drinks, we'll do the uh, rolls and the Royces. I don't know. We'll, let's pray. Well, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us, about, both by automobile and internet. 
We thank you for that wonderful ministry of the Internet. We pray these people would stay with us through the book of James. Uh, it won't be a short trip, but it will be a good one. And so, Father, encourage our hearts. May we, may we vote uh, the convictions of our heart. And, and uh, a, as we discuss our future uh, in uh, ministry, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.